Our next speaker is John Lynch. John Lynch is a Silicon Valley sales and marketing executive specializing in high-tech startup ventures. He's a member of the board of directors of Fair Mormon and serves as chairman. He's been with Fair Mormon since the very beginning and helped and was one of our, one of its founders. So with that, John Lynch. Applaud or prayers? I think I'll take the latter. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to share a few of thoughts and remarks with you today. It's been weighing on my mind quite a bit, the remarks that I'm planning to share. I had one of those great technological flubbers that uh, we're sometimes subject to. I had been for quite some time making my notes in my cell phone, and then my cell phone itself started having problems with an echo and I called tech support and they said well we need to reset it yeah that was my thought too oops oh don't worry we can recover it all um, that was the first lie I discovered about high tech not um, anyway my I said something to my wife about the fact that you know gosh I've got to go back and recreate all this stuff and she reminded me I've been writing this talk for 20 years and uh, I really have. It's been all of the experiences that I've had with Fair Mormon leading up to this time. I hope that I can share a little bit that will be helpful. Now just by what show of hands, how many of you here um, have a family member, a close friend, or a ward member that has struggled with their faith that you know personally? Okay, a few of you. Um, how many of you have been invited or assigned or felt compelled to help one of those individuals? Okay, so I've got the right audience then. In Luke chapter 9, it says that, And it came to pass, as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said unto them, Whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. Now at that point, Peter clearly had a testimony of Jesus Christ. He had given up all. He was, by all accounts, a fairly accomplished businessman in the fishing trade. He gave that up according to the scriptural account, at a moment's notice and walked, all, walked away from that. He followed Christ through difficulties and trials, through criticisms. And here the Lord was asking him, who do you say that I am? And he said, thou art the Christ. He had a spiritual revelation from Heavenly Father that Jesus was indeed the promised Messiah. But then we find in Luke chapter 22, the following account. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I find that just miraculously curious, because the Lord here talks, about, talks to Peter, his future prophet and leader, who had forsaken all and gone to follow Christ, who declared of a spiritual witness that Jesus was the Christ, told him, when thou art converted, Strengthen thy brethren. There clearly was some deeper change that needed to take place. Oddly enough, the next verses, I think, reveals a bit of it. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And there's no doubt in my mind that he was willing. But then he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day uh, before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And we all know the story of what happened. He followed Christ up into, the, um, up into the palace when he was to be scourged and judged. And as he stood outside warming himself by the fire, individuals recognized him and he denied it. And of course, the third time after denying it, the cock crowed and he went away weeping. Peter had a weakness. He was human. Did he have a faith crisis? Maybe, maybe a little bit. His confidence was weak. Though he was willing to, uh, to announce that he was willing to go through death, here he was 
denying the Savior that he loved. I called um, somebody that I've worked with for a number of years, a woman by the name of Carol. And I asked her last night, I said, if you could give one piece of advice to people who are helping people like you, what would that one piece of advice be? Her answer, I don't know, we're going to not work again today. Am I pushing the right button? There we go. Oh, just a bit of a delay. Where are we going? No, go back. You're jumping my thunder. Come on. One click. Go back one more. Okay. Thank you. Her number one message was judge not. She talked about the fact that she was already self-conscious with the doubts that she was having as she was examining her faith. And she had a great amount of fear about how that was going to be perceived. And she felt pressure just at the thought of people judging her. And I think that we have a tendency within the church to place such a value on that faith-affirming knowledge. We look up to those people who stand at the pulpit and tell you, I know. It goes back to the days of Joseph Smith, who absolutely did know. He had interviews with heavenly beings. You know, I, I once asked my mission president, who's now elder, well, now the um, emeritus elder Arnold, I asked him, I said, if you could go back and meet any, any pre president of the church or any prophet, he'd say, oh, I'd pick Joseph Smith. He said he knew the rest of them. You know, he could tell me about them all. Joseph, Joseph knew, and we look at people like that, and we put them on this pedestal. And it's so prevalent within the church that when somebody doubts, it seems like almost this great failing. And people are self-conscious of that. They recognize it, and they realize it. And that anything that comes across as judgment causes them to withdraw even more. And in reality, what they need more is to be smothered in the affections of other people. Mother Teresa said, if you can go to the next slide, um, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. Now, Carol also expressed to me, she says, it's that very love that causes me to trust people. What happened with Carol was her husband wrote into Fair Mormon. We have the Ask the Apologist, and maybe some of you have used it, avail yourself of it from time to time. We have about 100, 150 volunteers fluctuating from any given moment. And when somebody writes into us, all of us receive it. And those that feel inspired and feel that they have something to contribute, respond back. Her husband actually had written in. And he said, you know, my wife is thinking about leaving the church. She's struggling with a number of issues. She struggles with um, the temple and the priesthood. And I just, I don't know what to do. What can I do? And three or four of us wrote back, and I was very proud of the fact that we all had the same message, which was, whatever you do, still love her. And the next, the next email we got back from him said, in essence, we're standing here, I'm sitting here typing as we type to you with tears in our eyes because of the messages that you have given us it gives us a feeling of hope that led to a direct correspondence with Carol in my particular case it lasted several years um, it started out with emails and I told her I would be willing to listen as much as she wanted the first few exchanges I had with her I asked her you know what are your issues I'm thinking I'm gonna tackle this from an issue basis right let's just take this head on and she brought up some of her issues and I had great answers which didn't work okay they simply didn't work I gave her answers and every time I sent her something she had something to come back that countered it and it shifted and it was a moving target and you know I'm thinking what's going on here and she was clearly in a state of distress let's go to the next slide please she was experiencing a whole host of emotions and a lot of these emotions can actually be attributed if you look at it to similar emotions that are felt when somebody has a violation of trust in an interpersonal relationship right a marriage goes sour or there's infidelity or something along those lines if you could hit the next button 
Because what happens is, is these things start to swirl around you, right? And it's not that they're, that they're isolated, they're just one or two. Oftentimes what happens is they start to gang up on you. These emotions compound themselves. And before you know it, they're swirling all around you and you have this tremendous pressure, okay? Now, Trevor, hit it twice. And what you want, hit it twice. You got it is for it to stop, right? You want all that gone. Now hit it one more time, please. And what that does, if you can get rid of it, you're still left lonely. Why? Because you feel isolated from your faith community. You, you feel isolated from all the people that can help you because you're confused, you feel pressure. Now Steve Densley and uh, Forget his, his, his companion, I, sorry, because I know Steve very well. He worked with us at Fair Mormon for years. But they talked about this idea of the pressure and having to get rid of it. And sometimes just escaping the pressure is what is sought for. And so when you get in that circumstance and you just want it to stop, sometimes it means that you have no one to turn to. When they, when they look for, then some, for some support, oftentimes they go to some other community where people have already exited the church and they find their support there. Carol was very fortunate because she decided to stick with us and to um, continue to take our advice. Now if you go to the next slide, one of the things that you have to remember, and I think Stephen Densley brought this up as well, is you have to invite patience. Next click, please. Okay, you have to invite patience. That should not be your reaction. Okay, the home alone kid, you know, ah, uh, um, what you really need to do is, number one, listen, okay? If you could just click through with me. Number one, listen. Listening is one of the most important things you can do. Why? Because it lets the person know, if nothing else, that you care about the things that they care about. You're not eager to talk. You're not looking to, oh, I know what you're thinking. I, I, I know you brought up that thing about Joseph Smith, and I know the answer. Just relax. Don't worry about it, okay? You yourself be patient and just listen. Second, some of the messages you can give, right? I can only imagine. You don't have to know exactly. Empathy is the ability to imagine the pain and suffering of another such that you, you actually feel it in some ways. In fact, I believe that the atonement is just a great act of empathy where he went into the Garden of Gethsemane thinking upon our sins and our mistakes and felt what we would normally feel. What we need to do is we need to try and imagine, put ourselves in their shoes. We need to convey that and not just simply with some kind of um, rote appearance of empathy, but we need to actually try and imagine. Next. We need to communicate that there are no quick fixes. You cannot enter into a world where you are questioning and doubting and find it where you can go back the way you came. You can't. It's like Napoleon who burnt the bridge, right? He told his men, if you want to get home, it's through the enemy. You're not going back the way you came. And that's true here. There are no quick fixes. It's going to require work, energy, effort on both your part as the person helping and the person who is going to be helped. Next, please. You have to tell them that it won't be easy. Don't tell them it's going to be. You can tell them it's going to be fine because it will be. But it's not going to be easy at the beginning. Jack Welsh, uh, a couple nights ago, we were um, having a meeting with uh, the Mormon Voices group between uh, Interpreter and, and Book of Mormon Central and Fair Mormon. And we were talking about the fact that, that patience was needed. And he pointed out that the term passion and patience share the same root, which means suffering. Okay? Patience actually requires, it actually incorporates this idea of pain and discomfort. You don't need patience to do something that's fun. You need to do patience to do something that is discomforting. Next, please. Once you start, there's no stopping. I've already mentioned that. You have to go through. If you stop in the middle, chances are you're going to throw the baby out with the bath wash. Next slide. Next, please. Assure them that there are answers. We had a couple at one of our Fair Mormon conferences when we were up in Sandy came to me one day, and they said, you know, we've been out of the church for eight years now and we came to the conference because we heard about it we didn't know about it and you guys have answered all the things that we left the church over had we known this eight years ago we never would have left there are answers they're not necessarily here right now this is why patience is needed 
all of us have this question shelf that we can take the things that we're concerned about and we can put it there and we can wait on it. We can go away and come back to it, take it down, examine it, think about it some more, put it back if we need to, okay? But we have to just know, have that assurance that there are answers. Next, please. We have to reassure, reassure them that they will find peace. In the time when they're in turmoil, that listening, that loving, that compassion, that empathy will help signal to them, indeed, that there can be peace just simply by the way you're reacting. Next one, please. Let them know that you're in it for the long haul. You're not there to give them a couple answers and move on. Next slide, please. Or next. And let them know that you are absolutely there to help, that you'll be with them the whole way. Please continue. Um, go ahead and click, if you would. Moroni 10, 3 through 5. Um, just start with number 3. Go ahead and click it. This is Moroni's promise. I would exhort you when you shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God, that you should read them, that you would remember. And what does he want you to remember? How merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the fall of Adam down until the time that you shall receive these things and ponder it in your hearts. God is setting a stage here. He wants you to have a remembrance that he loves you, that he cares about you. Okay? He doesn't want you to forget that. Why? Because it leads into the way you will view everything else that you do going forward. And as you will remember, and we'll get to these scriptures here in a little bit more, the next two verses explain that this is the way you know the truth of all things. This is the first step, remembering. It's setting the stage. Next slide, please. Go ahead and hit enter. There's certain points of departure that we can find ourselves in. The first one is our assumptions, right? We can assume, click it, um, we can assume that the church is good or the church is bad, that a prophet means well or the prophet doesn't mean well, that the apostles just want to get rich or they want to truly help people, right? What are our assumptions about those that lead us, about the church that we serve in, about the desires and even the history of the, of the origins of the church? Those assumptions can lead to the next portion, which is how, what information we accept, if you can go ahead and click it. Right? So what is that information? Next, next click, please. We can accept or reject certain information based on those prior assumptions. If we make wrong assumptions, we might reject something that is actually pertinent and important to the issue. Next click, please. The next thing we have to do is interpret that information. What does it mean? Okay, let me give you a case in point. Did Joseph Smith marry a 14-year-old? Now, if my assumption is that Prophets should not marry 14-year-olds. That somehow that indicates a, a form of perversion. Then everything that I'm going to collect and accept as information is going to reinforce. I'm going to accept those things that reinforces as a tendency, just out of confirmation bias. And I'm going to tend to reject those things that really re, uh, exonerates the prophet in that regard. So the, did the prophet Joseph Smith marry a 14-year-old? Yes. He did, okay? But what's my interpretation of that? How do I interpret it? What does it mean? Well, first of all, let's get the correct information. Because there's pieces of information that a lot of people don't have. He was invited by the parents to be, to be uh, sealed to that 14-year-old. By all accounts, there is no evidence of any children coming from that. So even the, the intimacy may be called into question, okay? Um, was 14 years old that, out, that far out of the norm at that time period? No. Craig Foster and others have done research on that and have found actually that it was rather common. If you look at the marriages that Joseph Smith had that were polygamous, this was appropriately in the, in the realm of those ages. In fact, in many states, the age for, cons uh, for consent of marriage was 11. Okay? So presentism, the idea of putting our mores and values today onto the past, causes us to look at that with a side eye. But back in those days, it wasn't the type of thing that would have caused as many people the kind of sideways glance that we give it today. So that interpretation, click it please. Um, good or bad, right? How do we interpret it? Is the reality that Joseph Smith did this or that that prophet said that or that this event happened in church history, is it good or bad? And then the last thing, of course, 
is the application of it. What do we do about it? What is our decision? Next click, please. We can either decide to stay or to leave. And in all of this, one more click, we can cycle back and forth through these, right? Our application, in one instance, can form our assumptions, which causes us to change what we accept or reject of information, and then that changes our interpretation and it can cycle, right? Next slide, please. I'm a convert to the church. I was baptized when I was 19 years old, went on a mission 18 months later. By the time I came back from Panama, I had spent more time as a missionary speaking Spanish and learned more hymns in Spanish than I had in English. I had experiences from the time before I was baptized till the time I got home and even till today that were transformative. They changed my life, they changed my heart. I am a different person today than I was the day that I first entered the waters of baptism. Those that, uh, that knew me, I had uh, a high school kid that, uh, that, I went to high school with him and he was in my ward and he got up one fast in testimony meeting about six months after I'd been baptized and he stands up and he says, the church has to be true. If it can change him, it can change anybody. And I will add my amen to that. The church has changed me. I have had spiritual experiences I cannot deny. They have mounted, they have been myriad, they have been profound. And those are my exclamation marks. Now, do I have questions? Oh yeah, there's a lot of things I don't know. I'll share one that I had, and this goes back to the issue of patience. I struggled with the idea of polygamy. Um, until um, there, was a, there was a talk given here at Fair Mormon, the, the author of The Two Trees. She came and she spoke, and forgive me, I'm, I'm forgetting her name, but Valerie Hudson, thank you. Valerie Hudson, she, um, she gave this talk that basically put it in the perspective of an Abrahamic covenant that could be not only just for us as individuals, but even for the entire church, both the implementation, and then once everybody got comfortable with it, the removal of it, right? And that changed a thought for me in terms of the fact that polygamy didn't have to be any kind of a barrier for me. I didn't let it be a barrier. I had the patience because I had enough exclamation marks in my testimony that I didn't have to give it up because of that one issue. So what I encourage you to do is when you're dealing with somebody who's struggling here, help remind them of their exclamation marks in their life. What are the things that they know and believe? They had spiritual experiences to get to those points. They're going to be questioning those experiences. They're going to be doubting them. But have them tell them. The retelling invites the spirit. It invites the same spirit that attended. That's why reading the scriptures is so powerful. Because we're reading the telling of a spiritual experience. And it invites that same spirit. So don't ever trade your questions. Don't trade your exclamation marks for your questions. Hold on to those exclamation marks. And deal with the questions over time. Next slide, please. Click it again. That idea of remembering, okay, your own experiences, how the Lord has been merciful with you. Remember that. Don't forget it. Don't let go of it. Encourage the person you're helping to remember that, to hold on to those exclamation marks. Be patient. Don't cling to them. You don't have to cling to them like out of desperation. But remember them. Hold on to them and don't dismiss them. The questions will be answered. Next slide, please. And you'll remember this from yesterday. Believing that God is a loving God contributed to limiting or reducing anxious traits. Remember that anxiety, that slide with all the things swirling around you? You need help them relax. They need to be patient. Otherwise, they want to just throw it out. They just want it to stop. Those who view God as less loving or more controlling exhibited more anxious symptoms. Remember how merciful the Lord hath been unto the children of men from the fall of Adam down until the time that you shall receive these things and ponder it in your heart. Next slide, please. That's why we have to focus on that idea of perfect love. It casts out all fear. That anxiety relaxes when people know that they are loved. Now, in the correspondences that I had with Carol, um, they went on for um, actually quite some time. She, uh, we actually got to a point where um, I said, you know what, let's just take a step back here a little bit and 
we'll talk whenever you're ready, but let's set a time. So we decided that at 4 o'clock, she, she lived in another state, and I lived in California, so we just decided that at 4 o'clock my time, um, she would give me a call, and if she wanted to, or I would call her, and if she didn't want to talk that Sunday, that was fine. But I would just sit there, and the main thing I would try and do is just listen and just help her think through some things. She had, fortunately, a member of her stake presidency who she had a good, um, trusting relationship with. He didn't judge her. He said many of the things that I, re that I said to her. He said many of the things that I reflected, uh, or that I showed on one of my previous slides here, that are, are good for us to um, share as we work with these people as we work with these people that we care about and that we love, our family members and our friends. So make sure that they know that they're loved. Bear with patience yourself. I mean, there are times when I feel like I would crawl through glass to help some people. I have the privilege right now of serving as a bishop in Campbell, California. That gives me opportunities to counsel with myriad people. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come in and say, I'm distressed, I'm distraught, I've learned some things, I've read some things, and they can't unread them. And after an hour or two, oftentimes I'm able to give them a little bit of comfort. I will tell you one thing. Most often, because of the anxiety and the fear of judgment, especially if you're a, a church leader, the courage it takes for someone to come to you and willingly reveal that they are struggling is a tremendous amount of faith. Imagine the lion tamer, right? The lion tamer walks up, opens the lion's mouth and sticks his head in. He raised that lion from a cub. He used to put milk on his hair so he'd lick it, right? He's not afraid of that lion. But call the little old lady from the third row to come down and stick her head in the mouth of that lion, right? How much courage does it take for her? By comparison, those of us who have had these profound exclamation mark experiences in our lives, when we hit questions, we oftentimes have the patience. And it doesn't take as much faith for us in that sense. But you take someone who persists in the church despite their doubts and keeps going and keeps wanting to get past this, they are exercising tremendous faith because they have all these reasons to doubt. They have all these question marks and they're still coming. In Carol's case, she kept going to church and I kept telling her, Carol, you are my hero. She says, what are you talking about? I have these doubts. I don't, I don't know these things and these things and, I, have, and I, I don't like this and I don't like that. And I said, yeah, but Carol, you're still going. I mean, my goodness, what great faith does that take? So I commended her, okay? Show that perfect love. Next slide, please. What we need to do is invite the Spirit, okay? Number one, click please. Get your hands dirty in the service of the Lord. And what I mean by that is, sometimes we can do the gospel doctrine thing, and sometimes we can do the thing that is really hard where that person is, is difficult to deal with. Um, their house isn't clean, doesn't smell well. Their kids are unruly. They have a big dog that jumps on you. Right? Whatever it is, they're struggling. Go anyway. Get your hands dirty. Don't worry about the appearances. You can't do this from a gospel doctrine class. You have to do it one-on-one. -on -one. You have to sit down with the person. You have to listen to them. You have to cry with them. You have to feel their emotions. You have to feel their anxiety. And you have to try and lift it from where they're at. So get your hands dirty in the Lord. Next click, please. You have to encourage them to fill their mind with the voice of God. And I go back to the scriptures. These are some of the greatest spiritual leaders of, our, of history. They've recorded their spiritual experiences in books we call scripture. The Lord has spoken through them. The experiences and the spirit that attended those experiences is renewed upon us when we read them. We become accustomed to the voice of God when we read the scriptures. And that's important because then we can recognize it when he speaks to us. Which leads me to the third point, which is, God is a personal God. Make him personal to you. Have that personal relationship. Teach the person how to do that through personal prayer, through contemplation, 
by sacrifice, by struggling, pouring it out, being honest with God, not being accusing to Him, but giving it to Him and saying, God, help me with this. Show me where I need to go. And then act on it. Next slide, please. The next portion of this is really about information and truth. Go ahead and click, please. This is the scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 9, verse 8. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Okay? How often have we heard people complain about the fact that, um, that when they have faith and, or doubt, we tell them they need to pray more? Well, they do need to pray more. Okay? But they don't need to just pray more. They need to understand these things. They need to study it out in their mind. Study it. Find it. Okay? And then he says, And if it is right, we will cause it your bosom shall burn within you, that therefore you, will, you shall feel that it is right. So it is, you don't feel that it's right until you've studied it out in your mind. That's why it's not an easy fix, why you have to pursue through it. In DNC 8 verse 2, he says, Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost... Uh, excuse me, I will, I will, be, yea, behold, I don't know how I got an extra word in there. Behold, I will tell you in your mind and your heart by the Holy Ghost, which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. Now behold, this is the spirit of revelation. Now a lot of people think that revelation is, I don't have any information and God's just going to, boom, teletype cause me to just do it, right? It's you know, the, the spirit takes over me and I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm a teletype machine. That's not the way it works. Elder Bednar has explained to us that it's not so much a light switch, although that can happen, but it's most often a rising sun. First there's a glimmer of light, and then there's a little more, and then it rises more and more over time. Another reason why we need patience. The light switch can happen, but oftentimes it's after we accumulate little tiny horizons of a sunrise before they combine together, become a full sun on the horizon. We need to ex ex encourage people to have patience. But the, we oftentimes have to change our thinking and help other people change their thinking about how revelation works. Joseph Smith, you know, when he was translating the Book of Mormon, didn't know that there was a wall around Jerusalem. He tur turns to his wife while he's translating. He says, is there a wall around Jerusalem? He was as much a student of the restoration as he was one of his main participants. When he received the sealing power, there's great evidence that he wasn't sure how to use it, right? And so there was sealing of brother to brother and things like that, you know, and, and um, it wasn't until the, the, the turn of the 20th century that really we got the pattern that we have today, which is a sealing of children to parents up to Adam into the family of God, which is really what we're being sealed into, is it not? Next slide, or next Moroni, and when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. Now, I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, that's just a rhetorical device, and it may be. I admit it, okay? But I find it curious that they say, ask if these things are not true, because what does it imply? If you're asking if it's not true, it implies that you mean that you already accept it. And I find the word curious, and when you shall receive these things, not get them, not read them, receive them. Think about your temple or covenants, right? You receive certain things. It has a very particular meaning, a very particular significance. When we receive the Book of Mormon, we're reading it, we're saying, oh my goodness, look at the truth that I'm finding in this. Look at the goodness that's in it. Heavenly Father, is this false? And if you shall ask with a sincere heart, meaning you really want to know, with real intent, meaning that you will really act on it, you intend to act on it, having faith in Christ, that you trust God, the reason for remembering to begin with, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Next click. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. So when somebody's seeking to overcome their doubts, this is where the answers lie. Next slide. As you seek truth, you need to get the whole picture. Often the problem isn't that people study too much, but that they actually study too little. They dip their toes in, they get their feet wet, and then they say, the water's cold, I'm not getting in. Okay? And what they do is they basically reject all the information that they had. 
There's a quote here by Alexander Pope, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. There, shall, there, there shallow draughts intoxicate the brain and drinking largely sobers us again. Light drinking will cause you to have fear and doubt. Deep drinking will carry you through it. Next slide, please. This is a universal truth. Google does not equal research. It just doesn't, okay? It, the, 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 the top rankings don't even, you know, basically Google ranks things based on popularity of clicks and how much you're connected to somebody else. So if a whole bunch of people are all unitedly um, clicking on the same things that are wrong, you're going to get the top Google result that's going to be something that's wrong. Next click, please. Whole picture. Okay, mom, I got a new car. What happens, mom's in the room? How do you feel about your 16-year-old with that car? Okay, click it. The whole picture. It's painted on the side of a bus. Okay, that bus is fine. Now, I used this in a previous presentation I did for Fair Mormon, but it just illustrates the point so well, right? What we're talking about here is you need the whole truth. Oftentimes, with things like with Joseph Smith and marrying the 14-year-old, you need the whole truth. You need to know the circumstances around it. Okay, the book of Abraham. Okay, we have these fragments. They don't say what... Joseph said that they were translated. We've got real Egypt, Egyptologists that have translated this, and it's wrong. Well, the whole truth is, we'll talk about it in a minute. Next slide. This, there's actually, um, you can't see this. There's, there's the, the lower half. There's sizes of boxes equally large. We know from uh, historical accounts that the fragments that we have today are just small portions, 10% or perhaps even less of the actual content uh, of the scrolls that Joseph Smith had are extant today. Um, and so what we do know is that what we have, does, we should not expect to find the book of Abraham on these scrolls, right, on these fragments. Go down here. Next slide, please. Yet despite that, there's some things that Joseph got right that he should not have, okay? Abraham, because we, and these are, these are concepts that are in the book of Abraham that, were, that are not in the biblical text. These are extra biblical traditions about Abraham. Now the problem is, they come from the sources down below, okay? So for example, the Apocalypse of Abraham was likely originally written in Hebrew in the second century. Um, it only existed in the Slavonic languages at the time of Joseph Smith. So it's possible, I suppose, that Joseph traveled to, uh, to Moscow where this was stored and learned Slavonic, right, and read this account and said, oh, that's good, I'll throw that into the book of Abraham, okay? Um, we've got other things. You've got the Testament of Abraham was first translated into English in 1892, 48 years after Joseph Smith. Jubilees uh, was an Ethiopic uh, Greek and in Latin, and uh, then German in 1851, which was six years after Joseph. So Joseph could have learned German and maybe gotten it, um, but he had to time travel six years. Um, and then there was, wasn't translated into English until the 1893. Philo, the earliest translation was 1854, 10 years after Joseph passed, etc. Next slide, please. Um, those are all things that Joseph, actually go back to that if you would. Um, just want to cover a little bit. So there's the teachings of the Egyptians about astronomy, which is not in the biblical text. There's the visions of God's creations, the fact that that was included in the Abrahamic experience. Uh, Premortal existence, which is, by the way, is one of the core doctrines that we get from the book of Abraham. Um, foreordination, another one, Satan's rebellion, all of these things come from, from uh, ha share traditions of Abraham from extra biblical texts that did not exist at the time of Joseph. Next slide, please. So, Joseph could have time traveled, and here's some of the things. So, just click on the first two there, if you would. Um, the book of Abraham started in 1842. Sorry, one more. Um, this Heinrich Bu I don't even know how to pronounce this. If you have questions about this, this slide, I stole it from John Gee. So, um, so you'll have to ask him on some of the details. I'm going to plead, you know, I only play a, a, an Egyptologist. I'm not really one. But I did sleep in a Holiday Inn, so. Um, 
So uh, Bruch and Rouget, I guess that's how you pronounce it, these gentlemen were the first ones to translate really anything out of Egyptian. So this is, this is uh, what, uh, eight, nine years after Joseph, uh, seven, eight years after Joseph had, had passed in 1844. Next, um, you can just click through these. All of these are additional ones that have confirmatory content, extra biblical, that is included uniquely in the book of Abraham that was not included in the biblical text. Keep going. Okay, so all of these. And it goes all the way up to 2008. Joseph Smith, he had a Tarsus or something, is my guess, right? Go to the next one, if you would, please. Go ahead. Oh, covenants, yeah. Keep going. So when you're helping somebody, this is some more advice I want to give you. Find the core issue. When somebody comes to you and says, Joseph married a 14-year-old, what are they really saying? What are they really saying? They're saying that a prophet, assumption, would not do that. Okay? They're saying that it reflects poorly on his character. They're saying that he was perhaps a pedophile. They're throwing out accusations and they're basically biasing themselves with that. So you have to go to the core issue. And why do you have to do that? The reason is, is that if you answer the question, did Joseph marry a 14 year old? And I say yes. What do they say? Aha! I knew it. Okay? Their bias comes in and they say, no prophet would do that and they're ready to throw the baby out with the bathwash. But if you take the character of Joseph Smith as the core, I don't have to rely only on the question of did he marry a 14 year old. I can look at the whole corpus of evidence about Joseph Smith. It includes the, the works that he produced. Okay? The, the things that he endured. The character that he showed in his personal interactions with other people. All of these things. And, and if you go back and you read the Joseph Smith papers, right? The works that are coming out. Some of the diary entries. I was reading his diary entries. And you could see a stark contrast between his scribes who wrote in his diary that said he did such and such. And I was trying, you know, he met with so and so. Versus his own, which were pleadings. Lord, help thy servant. His personal writings were pleadings. His scribes' writings were diaries. Okay? That tells me something of his character. All of this comes into play. Next click, please. The other thing I would encourage you to do is take one issue at a time. By the time you get into this. And I wouldn't go to this point right away. When you're helping somebody, start out with them. Show that love. Be the listening ear. Encourage them to start doing the things that are going to invite the Spirit all of those types of things, but then deal with the issues one at a time when you start to dig in. Because you do have to answer these questions, right? They're still going to know. Even if they just completely relax, they still want to know. But they'll be more receptive. And if you try and deal with all of them, what's going to happen? That whole swirling, confusing shotgun blast of emotion is going to come back. Slow it down. When the world goes crazy, slow down. And that's exactly what you need to do, one issue at a time. Next slide, please. What are your assumptions, right? This is going back to the starting point. Let's think about Joseph Smith. What is our assumption about Joseph? Is he good or bad? Did he do some things wrong? Yeah, I'm sure he did. He obviously did, right? So what is our assumption? Next click, please. Can God use a damaged tool? I'll tell you what, I sure hope so, because if he doesn't, I'm useless to him. I am completely useless. Yes, the Lord can use broken tools. In fact, that's all he's got to work with. My young daughter, who's 12 years old, came to me one day and she says, Daddy, I'm broken. I said, sweetie, we're all broken. And we are. Okay? But the Lord can use us anyway. Maybe he's just got a shorter wrench. Okay? And he puts, needs to put more pressure on us because we're a shorter wrench because he doesn't have the length of leverage that he would otherwise have. Something along those lines. The same is true of Joseph Smith or any of our, of our leaders. Now I want to go through a few slides here real quick. And I, go to the next slide please. Joseph uh, came down with typhoid fever known as uh, nervous fever when he was seven years old in 1812. And I apologize what I'm going to show you, but I, I, have, I trust that you're far enough away from lunch that it won't matter. Okay? Because I want to actually impact you 
with the character of Joseph Smith by what I'm going to show you. Next slide, please. Joseph Smith, with the, ty with the typhoid fever, had a blister on his shoulder, between his shoulder and his chest, that lasted for several weeks, and when they finally pierced it, they estimate that they drained a quart of fluid from his shoulder. That lancing caused the infection to get into his blood. Now, he ran the risk of actually um, going septic. It went down and it got in his, in his bones, in the tibia of his left leg. These pictures here show what osteomyelitis does, and that's exactly what happened. It got into the bone marrow, and what actually happens, I'm not going to go through too much of an explanation here, I will spare you a little bit, but what happens is the infection causes pus. It actually ruptures the bone, the pus then can seep out, it's seeking an escape, new bone comes in and grows over the top of it because bones don't like to be broken, okay? So the new bone starts to grow back. It causes immense, immense pressure on the leg. They wanted to relieve that pressure, so they came in with a scalpel and they put a seven inch incision in Joseph's leg. Now he's seven years old. I'm guessing his tibia is about that long, the incision was about that long, okay? So what essentially happened was they put an incision down his leg to relieve the pain and pressure that was most of the length of his tibia. Next slide, please. Those are the tools that were available to doctors during the Civil War. This is a few years before the Civil War. I imagine that those tools, I would, I've got a number of those, I think, in my um, garage. Okay. Those were the surgical tools that they had. Now, by the time that Dr. Nathan Smith was called in, he was uh, one of the foremost experts in surgery in the area. So they really brought in the best of the best for, for young Joseph. He came in, he examined the boy, and he said, we need to amputate. And Joseph refused. He absolutely refused to have his leg amputated. And he, he knew that it, it was a risk of his life, right? About 40% uh, of people who don't get antibiotics um, die from this within a short period of time. And they didn't have antibiotics. So what they would do is they'd remove the leg in order to get rid of the inf in infection. The only other thing that could be done, Dr. Nathan Smith had done this about 10 years before, was to actually open the wound and remove that old bone. And then hope that light and air would cleanse the infection and they could then close up the wound. So he decided to do that. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to get Joseph drunk, mainly so he would relax, right? And then they wanted to tie him down so he wouldn't move and wiggle because you can imagine a, you know, a seven-year-old, how much he's going to try and move, how difficult that's going to make the, the procedure for the doctor. Of course, Joseph didn't want any of that. He had three requests. One, no alcohol. He wanted to be present when it was happening. Two, he wanted his mother out of the house. He was conscious of her, and he wanted her far enough away that she could not hear his screams because he knew what it was going to be, what he was going to go through. He did not want her to hear the screams. So they sent her out, and then all he wanted was his dad to hold him. And we know what happened, right? This was a violent surgery. They removed nine large pieces of bone that were removed by probably one of those devices that looks like a pair of snips down at the bottom. They had to grab it and they had to break it off. They removed nine pieces of bone. Now how do I know that it was a violent event? Not just because it was bone, because afterwards 14 smaller pieces of bone festered up out of the wound in the days that followed. Meaning this was not a clean process. They didn't have lights, they didn't have anesthesia, they didn't have a mask and gloves. This was just a brutal butchery that had to happen. We all know that Joseph was remarkable, but what's more remarkable to me is that this surgeon saw something in that seven-year-old boy that made him say, okay, no alcohol, not going to tie you down, your dad just to hold you. I will do this. What did that doctor see in a seven-year-old? that gave him confidence to do that. I think that says volumes about the prophet Joseph Smith. Next slide, please. And I'll just remind you that that leg was used when he was running from the crowds. It carried him on Zion's march, marches of a thousand miles or more. He even was known to, to wrestle. He did the stick pull and 
There's rumor that I've heard that he actually broke the tibia of one of the men that he wrestled against with his bum leg. Okay? <clears throat> Go to the next slide. This is one more that I want to share about Joseph's character. Many of you are familiar with the Missouri War of 1838. Joseph had sent W.W. Phelps and a number of other men there to buy land as speculation. They had an area, a county, that was specifically assigned that they could buy land and develop in. They went out there and they were, they were buying land and W.W. W. Phelps and some of the other brethren started saying, wow, you know what, a lot of people are going to be moving here. Let's get some of this land for ourselves as prices go up, right? So when Joseph arrived and he found out that they'd been doing this, that they'd been doing some land speculation on their own, he chewed him out. And it caused a rift. And I would say rightfully so that Joseph was angry, right? He was caring about the, the poor and the needy and all the people that were going to have to move there displaced. And so he chewed him out and they actually turned against Joseph. They went to some of the local newspapers and with some of their testimony and comments that riled the crowd against them, that led to the, to the Missouri War of 1838, that caused the death of some individuals and caused Joseph Smith and other leading brethren to be incarcerated for a number of months. And you can go and you can read some of the letters that Joseph wrote to his wife during, those, during that period. It is tender. He's more worried about her in many ways than he is himself, which again reflects more on his character. <clears throat> But because of that, W.W. W. Phelps basically left the church. He wrote to Joseph sometime later. He says, Brother Joseph, I'm alive and with thee, and with the help of God, I mean to live well still. I am as of the prodigal son. Though I never doubt or disbelieve the fullness of the gospel, I have been greatly abased and humbled. And I bless the God of Israel when I lately read your prophetic blessing on my head as follows. The Lord will chasten him because he taketh honor to himself. And when his soul is greatly humbled, he will forsake the, the evil. Then shall the light of the Lord break forth upon him as the noonday. And in him shall be no darkness. Next slide, please. Joseph responded, Had it been an enemy, we could have borne it in the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day when strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon far west. Even thou wast one of them. But thou should not have looked on the days of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. And he closed his epistle. And by the way, they had a vote. And they agreed, he had requested readmission to the church. And Joseph, they had a vote and they agreed. And he closed his epistle to him. Come on, dear brother, since the war is past. For friends at first are friends again at last. Something you may not know is that before the Kirtland Temple was, um, was completed, Joseph called W.W. W. Phelps and his wife into the John Johnson store and sealed upon them their exaltation. Is that really the way somebody who wants all the attention on himself? What does that say about the character of Joseph? He spent years in jail. He saw friends die. He saw his efforts thwarted. They got driven again out of Missouri. Had to start over in, 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 in Illinois, in Nauvoo. What does that tell you about the character of Joseph Smith? That right there. That's documented. It's undeniable. So brothers I, brother and sisters, I encourage you to think about these things. I've got a few more things I'll share here real quickly. Next slide, please. I encourage you to beware of extremes, both yourself as well as with the people that you're helping. If you think about following the prophet, if you have your identity to a political group or anything else, far left or far right, oftentimes doing that draws you away from the prophets. I watched as people from the left of the political spectrum in the United States became upset and incensed when the church stood behind Proposition 8. I then saw when the church stood behind immigration reform, those very people that stood up and defended the church for Proposition 8 came out and decried it from the other side. The problem here is one of identity. If you identify with a group that, and you have a greater affinity for that than you do for your brothers and sisters and the prophets and apostles of God, then you draw yourself oftentimes away from them. When I was in the missionary training center, uh, we had a pumpkin that was passed from district to district in one of the classrooms, and the MTC presidency came out and said, there will be no secret combinations in the MTC. And we thought, are you nuts? It's a pumpkin, right? 
And then I thought about it. The thing was is that the pumpkin was an identity thing, right? It was that district, and that district, you know, they carried the same name. And it was an affinity to that group, not the principal. Secret combinations cause you to have affinity for a group, secretly. Open combinations do the same thing, it's just you admit it, right? It can be political parties, it can be causes, it can be whatever it is. Just be, I just caution you to be aware that you're not allowing yourself to be pulled in either direction. Next slide, please. This kind of illustrates it, I think, in a better way. You know, if, if, if you feel to protest and your affinity shifts to the group protesting, what you're doing is you're drawing yourself away from your Heavenly Father, from His church, from His ordained leaders. And I encourage you not to do that. Next slide, please. Got a few things for you who are helping. Click the first one, please. Replenish and fill your cup with service. Whether you're the person going through the, the faith crisis, make sure that you're serving other people because I have found when I get my hands dirty in the service of the Lord, I feel the Spirit. It changes my mentality. My anxiety goes away. I feel better about myself. My endorphins must increase. So replenish and fill your cup with service. Next click, please. Make sure you balance your influences. We found this with Fair Mormon, okay? We, on a daily basis, get questions and comments and deal with challenges to faith and testimony every single day, sometimes the tunes of 100 or more emails. I find it personally that I have to give the Lord equal time. I can't deal, spend all my time on that and not go and fill my cup by speaking with my Father in heaven, by delving into the scriptures, by finding spiritual strength through the spirit I feel there. Next click, please. You can't rescue someone from the kiddie pool when they're treading in deep water, okay? Make sure that you know that if you're going to go out and help them, you're going to have to get just as involved in dealing with these issues as they do. You can't just grab stuff from Fair Mormon necessarily and give it to them. We've got a lot of really good stuff, okay? A lot of really good information. But you're going to have to process through it. You're going to have to understand it. You're going to have to take it to the Lord, right? Make sure that you've got those right assumptions, that you've got the right information, that you're including everything that needs to be included, that you're interpreting it correctly so that you can apply it correctly. Next click, please. Be prayerful, patient, and calmly persistent. If nothing else, just know that it's not going to be easy. Ignore the ups and downs because they're going to be there. When I was dealing with Carol, I dealt with a lot of that. Some days she'd be better and other days she'd be a lot worse. Next click, please. I just said that. Ignore the ups and downs. Go ahead. This is chocolate wisdom. Actually, they were giving out Dove chocolate in the back, and I opened it, and I saw this, and it actually says... Everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Okay? Sister Burton said, when the Lord's timing conflicts with our own desires, trust that there might be some preparatory experience the Lord needs us to have before our prayers are answered. Next slide, please. Elder Anderson pointed out in his talk, faith is not by chance but a choice. He says, faith never demands an answer to every question but seeks the assurance and courage to move forward, sometimes acknowledging, I don't know everything, but I do know enough to continue on the path of discipleship. Now I want to read this to you. Oh, if I'm going to be able to, you can go to the next one. Wow. I'm going to take the microphone down and I'm going to read it because I want you to hear this. Um, and my eyes aren't good enough to see it from back there. Last night I asked, I was talking to Carol, and, and late last night she sent me this email. And this is a quote from her. She said, after thinking just a little bit more about your question, I want to add one thing to my answer. Oh, I need to tell you, I need to finish the story here. Bear with me. A number of years we went back and forth. We invited her to the Fair Mormon Conference. She came very nervous about doing it. She wasn't sure she wanted to, but she came. And on Friday night, a group of us went out to dinner, and she came out with us, and she met um, one of our volunteers, Bob, and, her, and his wife. And they developed a, a pretty good friendship right there at the event. And she travels from her state to Salt Lake on occasion because of her profession. And so she would look them up and spend time with them. And I continued to correspond with her, so we are kind of getting her from two different angles. And one day she was down here. And um, where was it she was at? She was at one of the pizza places, if I remember, down here in Provo. And they took, invited her out to dinner, and there was another couple there, a gentleman who was a bishop. 
and they were sitting there and they started asking her questions about well, what's going on how are you doing you know well, I understand you're struggling with your faith why is that right and remember she's feeling pressure she wants out and she described to me that as she sat there and she was listening to that the pressure became began to be unsurmountable and she just thought and she said I haven't thought about having a blessing in 20 years and I thought okay Heavenly Father maybe I need a blessing but oh my goodness if you if, if they give me a blessing maybe then and sure enough by the end of the evening Bob turns to her and says Carol would you like a blessing and she was just so tense as soon as he said that she just relaxed they went home gave her a blessing the next day she went to the temple and sat in front of the reflecting pond and had this wash of love come over her and she said all of her stress relaxed now I'm gonna read this to you after thinking just a little bit more about your question I want to add one thing to my answer one thing that I think should be emphasized more love and be present with those struggling and engage wholeheartedly in such a way that both parties can feel the power and love of God if I had to choose a common denominator, a thread that ran through the impactful experience that I had with you, with, the, uh, with Bob and Gary and Lori, still can't remember their last names, and with President, I should have redacted this, it would be the love I felt um, in certain specific instances. None of my most sacred and powerful spiritual experiences have happened in a temple, a sacrament meeting, an interaction with the missionaries, reading the scriptures, etc. For me, they have happened and still happen one-on-one, -on -one, or in small groups where genuine compassion has been offered and received truly we create and provide a portal to the love of God through sharing our faith strengths experiences compassion etc when we walk hand in hand with and not in an above or superior position to others and as we become one in our desire intention and dedication to feel and recognize and share the real love with others Heavenly Father provides opportunities and answers for our prayers there are so many things I still don't know. There are plenty of questions in my mind and heart. But I will say this. Once I unmistakably and undeniably felt the love of God during that blessing, in answer to that very specific unspoken prayer, I've never been the same. Doubts and fears still come. Maybe they always will. But I do have a different repro uh, response, a different relationship to the truth challenges that have plagued me for over 20 years to the faith challenges that have plagued me for over 20 years I have a measure of peace that I didn't have before and that makes all the difference in the world I will report that one of the things she struggled with was the temple she had a hard time going back to the temple and I think it was about a year and a half after she had that experience on the um, reflecting ponds Carol renewed her temple recommend and went one time to the temple was a huge huge accomplishment with that I thank you you want to just forego you want us to just forego you want to forego you want to yeah why don't we forego what do we unless you want to yeah why don't we do you could catch him during lunch. I'm going to give him the questions, and if you want to talk to him, you could you could talk to him during lunch. Would that be okay? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Even you get one of these. It's it's a giant brownie, and I'm diabetic. I think he's saying I did a bad job. That was going to kill me. No, we all want to be his friend now, so we can eat the brownie. Ah. <laughs> so the, okay. So